All right, look, I know why you're here. You saw the title, so you clicked on the video to dislike it and probably leave a mean comment and then dip. But hear me out. I didn't dislike Avatar The Last Airbender, and I definitely don't think it's bad. But at the same time, I also didn't like it. And I'm very hesitant to call the show anything other than average. You can totally disagree. My opinion is obviously one not held by the majority. This show is incredibly loved by a massive fan base, and I don't mean to attack anyone's opinion about the show, so I welcome any discourse and discussion as long as it's respectful. If anyone even watches this to begin with. Now, I know some of you are 30 paragraphs deep into a rage-filled meltdown in the comments already, but for those of you that aren't yet, I'm hoping you can at least see my side of things and stick around to hear my entire point of view. I want to preface this by saying that this video will be focusing pretty much on only the negatives. If I were to sit here and make half this video about the good things, it would all be stuff you'd heard before. And let's be real, the positives aren't the real reason you clicked on this video in the first place. But I do legitimately believe that there are just as many good things about this show as there are bad. Hence why I believe this is a perfectly average show. I don't want to completely sideline the positives about the show, however, as that would entirely misrepresent my thoughts about Avatar as a whole, so I'll be bringing them up here and there. Just be aware that negatives are the main topic for this video. Also, this is all entirely my opinion. You are bound to disagree with something in this video, and that's okay. Just because I didn't like The Last Airbender doesn't mean you shouldn't. You're allowed to enjoy whatever it is you want to enjoy, as long as you're not hurting anyone doing it. Or if it's K-pop. Nothing that I state is fact, and none of it is a personal attack against you or what you like. That being said, let's continue. I'll get one major thing out of the way, and I'll be honest when I say it. This show was not made for me. It was made for kids, to be enjoyed by kids, and I imagine plenty of adults as well. However, I overall just don't care for kids' shows. I can go back and watch the earlier seasons of Spongebob occasionally, and I can still enjoy the creativity behind Phineas and Ferb, but those shows had a lot more going for them, including rewatchability and humor. Otherwise, though, I really don't care for kids' shows, and I have a difficult time getting into any one show if I haven't watched it as a kid already. The fact that I was willing and actively wanting to sit through this show just for Zuko's storyline alone is a testament to the fact that this show did some really great things, and I can see why people love it as much as they do. I guess I'll go ahead and start on an extremely subjective point that's bound to piss people off. The humor. The humor in this show basically never landed for me. I laughed every couple episodes at most, and the show never really got anything more than a small chuckle out of me most of the time. Except when it was unintentional, but we'll come back to that. What most people consider to be the comic relief of the show, Sokka, was simply almost never funny to me. Most of the jokes that revolved around him included him being made fun of by other members of the group, or him just being ridiculous and wacky, or some combination of the two. It wasn't funny at the start for me, and even if it would have been, that same joke structure gets reused throughout the entire show, and I was just so tired of it by the end. The majority of the time, the jokes were at least quick, so when they were bad, at least they weren't bad for long. The character that actually got the most laughs out of me was Uncle Iroh. I can't really explain why, but the humor from him was a lot more varied, and played well against the hot-headed Zuko for the majority of the show. What are you doing? I'm mugging you! With that stance? His quips and one-liners ended up landing the large majority of the time, as compared to, hey look, Sokka's being dumb and wacky. Isn't he dumb and wacky? I guess part of this makes sense since Iroh's humor, while not necessarily adult humor or anything, was not 100% childish like most of the humor around Aang's group, so it makes sense why I'd enjoy it more. I will say that one positive thing about the attempted humor behind Sokka and the group is that even despite it hardly landing, the group had a lot of chemistry together, and the dialogue always felt natural. That's actually a major plus for the show as a whole. The dialogue is usually spot on, and aside from the occasional in-your-face exposition, I never felt like anything was coming out of a script or an actor's mouth. Speaking of, the voice acting in this show is overall excellent. I can't think of a single character that felt miscast in the entire show. That's how well they nailed it. 
and that's not something that's easy to do. Without such fantastic performances, the chemistry between characters would have not been nearly as strong, so I have to commend the show for it. I mean, just listen to this scene. Uncle, I know you must have mixed feelings about seeing me. But I want you to know, I am so, so sorry, Uncle. I am so sorry and ashamed of what I did. I don't know how I can ever make it up to you, but I... How can you forgive me so easily? I thought you would be furious with me. I was never angry with you. I was sad because I was afraid you lost your way. I did lose my way. But you found it again. I'll also mention the characters before I get into anything else. The main cast has some overall good characters. Very few are truly fantastic. In fact, I'd give that award to pretty much only Zuko. Hello, Zuko here. But all of them are fairly unique and well thought out. On the other end, though, Tai Lee could have been omitted from the show entirely, or should have at least been given an arc like the other characters. Her involvement in the show seems to only serve the purpose of giving Azula a third goon to her goon squad. This is overall a small complaint, considering every other major character goes through at least some development, so I can't really fault the writers for not quite hitting the mark on just one character. And in the end, she does still have her own personality and charm to her, it's not like she's a blank slate or anything. Where the show really misses the mark, though, is the side characters. Every side character basically has one personality trait involved with them, and that's really it. The boulder likes to say the boulder before starting his sentences, and is big and loud. The foggy swamp tribe are dim-witted but friendly. King Boomy is zany and unpredictable, you get the idea. This is another thing I can't really fault the show for too much, they are just side characters after all, but I still can't help but feel disappointed with how bare bones they really are. I think the biggest disappointment as far as side characters go, at least for me, is Jet. Now, don't get me wrong, I think Jet is actually one of the strongest side characters. I really like him overall, but what I don't like is how the writers completely threw away his development. Let me explain. His character starts out very strong, we get a good sense for his motivations, and just how far he's willing to go for his beliefs. He's willing to sacrifice anything in order to defeat the Fire Nation. He's stoic and badass, all great things. However, when he shows back up later when the group goes to Ba Sing Se, whatever potential he had for growth and character development is thrown out of the window. Jake gets captured and brainwashed, completely changing his personality, and is later killed by Long Fang. This completely stifles what development Jack could have had in realizing the error of his ways and learning from them to grow as a character. Instead of getting anything like that, we get a sudden shift of him being brainwashed into a different person. And because he was killed so shortly after changing back to normal, he never had a chance to develop like he deserved. All for the Dai Li to see him like a bigger threat. This would honestly not be that big of a deal, after all, he's a side character, if the main cast at least took something from his death. But Jet dies, the main cast learns nothing about the experience except for Dai Li bad, and he's never brought up again for the rest of the series until the play. My god, the play. Getting PTSD just thinking about it. If Jet was ever mentioned again, it had to have been extremely brief because I don't even remember it. I can take a character dying with no long-term consequences if it means they got good development, and I can even take a character with no development if it means they get a meaningful death, like Yue. But Jack got neither of those things, and he truly deserved more since he was such a cool character. On the topic of characters with no development though, let's bring up a big one. Fire Lord Ozai. Welcome home. In no show that I have ever seen before has the main villain been so one-note, so boring, and so completely forgettable. If you were to ask me what kind of character Ozai is, I honestly wouldn't even know what to tell you, because he gets less screen time than some of the side characters, and he's the main villain of the show. Out of a 61 episode series, Ozai only appears in 12 of them, and 7 of those are in book 3. 
he shows up in half the amount of episodes as Azula with less than half the amount of screen time. The main antagonist of the series only truly showing up for the last third of the series is a serious amount of wasted potential and a massive miscalculation on the creator's parts. Not only is Ozai the only main character to not get any development, but Fire Lord Sozin, who only makes a major appearance for one episode in a flashback, gets better development and is a better character than Ozai. We never even see him fight until the final few episodes of the show. It's implied and we're told that he's an extremely powerful bender, but without ever being shown how powerful Ozai is, we never feel like Aang is in any real danger during the fight, because we have no reason to believe he will be. We've seen Aang train for this one fight for close to 60 episodes. Why should we believe someone we've never seen before can beat him? Oh right, because the show told us to. I cannot overstate how important it is for a show to actually display a villain as being threatening, not just the characters telling us every so often that Aang is going to have a tough time beating him. I'm like a big growing snowball of nerves! Of course you are! That's because you gotta fight the Fire Lord, the baddest man on the planet! And you better win or we're all done for! There's a reason you hear show don't tell thrown around so often in story making. It is an extremely important idea. Azula is the perfect example of this actually done right. Whenever we see her, she almost always has an advantage on the group, and even when she doesn't, she finds a way to slip through the group's fingers. Not only that, but because we spend so much time with her in the show, we have a much better understanding of her goals and who she is as a character. So she's a better character with real development, we see much more of her than Ozai, and she's actually proven herself to be a threat to the group multiple times. How and why is Azula not the main antagonist? <sighs> Speaking of Azula though, while I cite her development as a positive, I still have my issues with it. Throughout the show, she's displayed as power hungry and manipulative, as well as extremely powerful. Which is great, she's a very basic and easy to understand character, but also cunning and compelling in her own ways as well. My problem stems from the fact that her development only really comes to fruition throughout one episode. It was supposed to be implied that Azula becomes distrustful after Mei and Tylee betrayed her, but the show doesn't even make a nod towards this when her development really begins. Well, I say begins, but it's over so quickly that you hardly even notice it. The show has to throw in some random servants we've never seen before for her to throw out in an attempt to show her distrustful nature but it fails miserably because there was no build-up to it. She just ends up firing people randomly that happens to be after the fact of May and Tylee's betrayal. I get what they were going for, but it lands flat on its face in terms of execution because of a lack of cohesion. You can't just decide that a person suddenly feels distrustful. Development is something that should be happening over the course of an entire series, not just one episode. And when you do a character's development, you need to have the threads attached, even if it's just implied. Do not make your character insane for the last few episodes just because she's supposed to be. You need to sell your audience on it, too. The real nail in the coffin for her development, though, is, in my opinion, the final fight between her and Zuko and Katara. Them arriving just as Azula is about to be crowned feels extremely contrived. Especially since this takes place just after Zuko decided for himself that he would be the Fire Lord, but this show has no subtlety anyway. Not only does Azula challenging Zuko to an Agni Kai feel unnatural, but the fight itself destroys the hope of a true one versus one between her and Zuko I had been itching for for basically the entire show. Yes, it makes sense for Azula to play some trick against Zuko and Katara, but she honestly shouldn't have even been there to begin with, and why was she directly on the field during the Agni Kai in the first place? It honestly feels like the writers just didn't know what to do with her when it came down to the final battle, so they just said screw it, throw her in with Zuko, forcing the battle into two halves where Katara is the one to finish the battle off when Azula is the sister and antithesis to Zuko makes absolutely no sense to me. Zuko should be finishing this fight, not Katara. A battle is best displayed when two ideologies are being tested against one another, throwing that philosophy completely out of the window so that Katara could have someone to fight in the end destroys the satisfaction that battle should have had. Not only this, but because Azula's ideologies weren't fully tested against Zuko's, 
we can't see Zuko truly show that his ideologies were better. His development now holds less meaning. It would have made much more sense to show after all of Zuko's growth, especially after adding the idea of what is supposed to be a more superior, more natural way to firebend compared to Azula's, him winning in a real one-on-one -on -one despite Azula pulling some dirty tricks would have been much more satisfying, and Azula would have been forced to see the error of her ways, rather than just losing to a character who had close to no connection to her at all. Zuko's development never being fully tested against Azula's is a major blow to both of their character arcs despite what was otherwise a great arc for Zuko and a decent one for Azula. Why not have Katara arrive first, be defeated by Azula, and then have Zuko come in to rescue her? This way we could get a real one versus one between the two siblings, the fight has more at stake with Katara being at risk, there's no need for a contrived reason to have Katara on the field, and we get a true, satisfying ending to Zuko's character arc. Okay, you know what? I can't take it. I need to talk about that ridiculous recap episode. The episode takes place right before the finale of the show, and I don't understand why it exists. It's completely unfunny, the characters look ugly and gross, and it entirely severs the pacing at the most critical point in the show, right before the finale. If there is anything about this show I never, ever understand, it's what the hell the writers were thinking when they made this episode. I can't comprehend how the show decided to incorporate episodes like this when other parts of the show needed so much more room to breathe to really work such as Aang's water and firebending practice, the White Lotus reveal and explanation, Azula's descent into madness, and many, many others. The fact that this episode exists when the series doesn't even dedicate a full episode to its conclusion feels insulting. I'll actually continue this break from talking about the characters to mention this now. The show feels extremely rushed and way too fast-paced at times. Dialogue and scenes are, in general, extremely quick. This leads to a lot of places where more time was needed to really feel the full effect of what was happening, like with the examples I just mentioned. This is an ongoing problem for the series, and I don't necessarily have a problem with the pacing being so fast, but I do have a problem with it not slowing down for moments that need more room to breathe to be effective. The biggest moment of the show that really didn't work and needed more time was Yue and Sokka's relationship. It starts out okay, Sokka acts like a dork in front of her and she finds him kind of endearing so they decide to meet later on, but from that point on, their relationship starts moving at a thousand miles per hour. It's very clear that the writers took heavy inspiration from Romeo and Juliet for their relationship, in fact it follows almost all of the exact same story beats. However, Romeo and Juliet works because it's a three-hour play, while Sokka and Yue know each other for roughly two episodes, and their relationship is pushed to the side to make way for more important plotlines as well. We're supposed to believe that these two have deeply fallen in love when they've spoken to each other for maybe five minutes total, and the entire thing exists in the first place because the audience is supposed to feel something when Yue dies. That isn't achieved though, and I can honestly say I felt nothing as she sacrificed herself. If they had given this part of the show even just one more episode, the ending to the first season would have been so much better, especially Sokka and Yue's relationship. Sokka and Suki's relationship actually had an extremely similar problem as well. Two characters had interacted for such a small amount of time before they were already dating, but at least this is made up by the fact that the two had some great chemistry together in the third season. Speaking of, though, why didn't Sokka seem to care at all when Suki got captured? Our group learns about it, but Sokka doesn't even mention Suki's name once until he stumbles across her by luck when they were going through with another mission. Azula is actually the one to mention Suki's name first. These two were supposed to be dating. She should be the first thing on Sokka's mind when they infiltrate the prison, yet he doesn't even mention her. How did the creators of the show really overlook something as important as that? I swear the third season is held together by string. There's also a lack of cohesion at certain points between episodes. Many feel episodic in nature, meaning they have very little or nothing to do with the episodes that came before and after them. For example, many of the episodes in the time when the group was traveling to the Northern Water Tribe could have been swapped entirely. If episode 4, The Warriors of Kyoshi, came after episode 5, The King of Omashu, nothing of note would be different or out of place. In fact, I think it would be hard to notice anything off about it at all. 
it gets to a point where I think, was there really a need for this episode? Or did this really have to happen in this order? And while this problem is easily the worst in season one, the next two seasons have their fair share of it as well. This overall lack of cohesion means so many episodes feel like nothing but filler, and I don't think any episode fits that description better than The Great Divide. Never have I laughed so hard at such a hilarious episode because it was so ridiculous. I mean, look at this. Everybody, watch me do what I do! And once I finished this episode, I realized that it had been entirely pointless. None of the characters introduced in this episode even come back later in the show, and it could have been removed from the show entirely and nothing would have been missed. Speaking of filler episodes though, there's also what I'm going to call filler characters. Characters that don't really serve a purpose outside of existing because the plot needs them to exist. Characters such as the Lion Turtle, Guru Patik, and Combustion Man aren't actually characters. They're plot devices. They don't have their own personality, development, quirks, you know, things that make a character a character. The Lion Turtle exists to teach Aang how to defeat the Fire Lord without killing him. Guru Patik exists to teach Aang about his chakra and later give him a moral dilemma. And Combustion Man exists to be a Terminator ripoff. These characters are a constant in this show. I don't understand introducing so many characters like this when the cast is already bloated to the point of no return. And why is it exactly that Combustion Man doesn't stop attacking the group when Zuko tells him to? Zuko specifically mentioned that he'd pay him more if he stopped, and Zuko was the one to employ him from the start anyways, so what purpose did he have to keep attacking the group? If it was a pride thing, they certainly didn't hint at it, but I think even that would be giving the show way too much credit. This might not be the only plot hole in the show, but it's one of the most ridiculous, and I don't understand how it went overlooked. The Lion Turtle also had a similar problem. Should we explain how Aang actually found the Lion Turtle? Maybe have Roku's dragon guide him there, or perhaps the forest spirit. Nah, let's just not explain it at all. The Lion Turtle feels especially insulting in this way because it didn't even explain why or how Aang was called towards it in his sleep. How does something that's as important to the ending of the show, such as the Lion Turtle, go completely overlooked? So many of these final episodes feel so incredibly rushed. There are other big plot holes as well. Aang is shown to be better than Katara at waterbending at every point in the show until the show just decides that Katara is now better than him. What about Aang? He still needs to learn waterbending. Well, then he better get used to calling you Master Katara. And Katara herself has a major problem in one episode. When she comes across a waterbender that can perfectly bloodbend, we're told it took her years to learn and master this trick. But somehow Katara can do it perfectly on her first try without any instruction? As far as inconsistency goes, I don't think any character fits that bill better than the main protagonist himself, Aang. He's not a terrible protagonist by any means, in fact I think he's quite good. But at so many points in the show, I question if the writer's attempt at his development actually meant anything. For example, when Aang first appears in episode 1, the first thing he wants to do when he meets Katara and Sokka is play. Now, this is fine. He's a kid, it's a kid's show, and he has plenty of room to grow. Skip ahead to the final season, right after suffering a crushing defeat from the Fire Nation during the assault on the Eclipse, with dozens of their forces being captured, with only the select few being able to escape, what does Aang first want to do when they escape? Go back to search for his friends? Find a firebending teacher right away to finish his training? Nope. He wants to play. It's as if the past two and a half seasons of what were attempted development for this character meant absolutely nothing to the writers. But I guess that's really the center of this problem. Aang doesn't actually develop. He just ends up acting however the writers want him to act without any regard towards development at all. They mold him for any given situation without giving him a second thought. 
They wanted Aang to act like a kid here, so they made him act like a kid. They may need Aang to act serious and adult somewhere else, so they'll have him act serious and adult. The only time he truly got any development was during the final few episodes of the show, but as I said before, character development is something that should be taking place across the entire show. His character may be the most inconsistent thing about The Last Avatar. What might be one of the largest issues in the entire show is actually one I thought I would see everywhere, but I haven't seen anyone even mention it but me. But then again, I'm like the only person on planet Earth that doesn't think this show is a masterpiece, so I can't expect much else. This problem is actually the tonal disconnect between Zuko's storyline and Aang's. Aang's storyline, through and through, is made for kids, and the impression I got from watching it, just for kids. But wait, Kletos, you say. You said earlier that this show was made to be enjoyed by adults as well. And that I did, random citizen. The reason I can see why adults enjoy this show is actually purely because of Zuko's storyline. Him and Uncle Iroh were pretty much the only reason I was able to get through this show in the first place. However, my issue stems from this exactly. Aang and his group are essentially made just for kids, outside of some mild adult themes. I might get a lot of flack for saying that, but that's what I genuinely believe. And at the same time, Zuko's storyline is much more mature. You can see where I'm going with this. One half of the show is made for teenagers and adults, and one half is made for kids. That tonal disconnect for the show is pretty damning in a lot of regards, at least for me which is why I was surprised to find that no one has even brought up this issue. This problem leads to essentially alienating your audience for one part of the show. I feel like I was constantly the only person in the room who didn't laugh when barf jokes were being made in Aang's half of the show, standing there awkwardly while pretending to take a sip from my cup. Yet I couldn't help but think, man this is fucking good, when Zuko was on screen. Note that I don't have an issue with kid shows. I don't think kid shows are bad, but as I said before, they aren't made for me. I simply prefer more mature stories, which is why I loved Zuko's story so much. It just feels like two different teams of writers are making two completely separate shows at the same time, and they hardly mesh well together at all. I hear myself thinking, this could have been so much better if Zuko was the main character. Or, at the very, very least, it would give the show some consistency. It feels like a snake and an eel tied together in an attempt to create one animal, but in reality, they just keep trying to swim in their own directions. And that's a really good way of describing how I feel about this show. Two ends tugging at one another. On one hand, I really want to enjoy it because it does a lot of great things. Zuko's storyline would be damn near close to a masterpiece on its own, for example. But, on the other hand, the show has so many shortcomings that I can't help but feel like it's just wasted potential in the end. That's why I hold the opinion that I do. The show isn't good, and it's definitely not bad, either. And I can definitely see why it's loved as much as it is, but to me, it's just average. And I really, really wish it was a lot more than it is. Thanks to those of you who made it to the end here. This is my first big and properly edited YouTube video, and definitely the largest video I've ever made. I put way more time into this than I probably should have, but in the end I think I'll be glad that I did. If you have any thoughts you want to share, or anything you disagree with, feel free to let loose your thoughts in the comments. I'll make sure to read all of them. If you want to see more of my content, you can find me on Twitch, which I'll link in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and have a great day.